Tom Brady walks away from the media. Should Houston reconsider Carmelo Anthony? Des Bryant is no pushover. OBJ is checked in. One question that surrounds Kevin Durant? We'll explain. Could the Brooklyn Nets surprise the NBA? All that and more on What's the 401 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. And today we have a very special guest joining us. We have Congressman Ed Towns from Brooklyn, New York. And for those of you who don't know, Congressman Towns played basketball while at college. Shout out to North Carolina a and And that he is also an avid golfer. The Congressman joins us today to talk about his upcoming golf tournament. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. <laughs> I'm really excited about this opportunity to come and talk about the golf outing that we're having over at uh, Marine Park on September the 27th. Of course, uh, it's for the Berean Family Life Center. And we have some outstanding golfers who indicated that they're going to uh, participate. And we also have a person that set a record in the Olympics, which is still not broken as far as the Olympics is concerned. The left record was broken outside the Olympics. A guy by the name of Bob Beeman, who understand that he's coming. And uh, we have several other football players uh, that have some of retired that indicated that they were going to come and they're going to play. And uh, we we're excited about the possibility because what happens with this is that. We raise funds that to assist young people uh, with college tuition, of course, and uh, we have programs that they operate out of the center. Uh, we have a drum and bugle corps that operates there. And then we have a um, debating team. We have all these things going on, and that this, these funds are used to support the Family Life Center and these young people. And I'm excited about the possibilities this year Last year was great, but I think this, this year coming up is going to be even greater. And uh, we have a big banquet at the end of uh, the golf outing, which uh, with a lot of people that do not play golf, but they come to the banquet, and they seem to really enjoy that banquet. And, I, you know, they, I mean, because it's a lot of fun. Of course, we give out the awards. They have a comedian. They have all kinds of things going on that evening, which is very exciting for people uh, to just come and be a part of what we are doing. So uh, to the golfers, come out on September the 27th. We tee off at 11 o'clock, shotgun. And, of course... <laughs> Prior to that, you know, we uh, get together and uh, and sort of register and all of that. Uh, it is was a very, very big, fun time last year, and I'm certain this year would be even better. Well, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, you know, there's not many golf courses. Obviously, as you pointed out, Marine Park, there's one, you know, the one in Marine Park. But did you get a chance playing growing up in Brooklyn playing golf, or when was it where you really got involved in the sport? I got involved in the sport after I got, went to Washington as a member of Congress. I um, uh, had a friend by the name of uh, Mike Oxley, and of course, uh, Mike was a player. And then, then I came back to Brooklyn, and there was a Dr. Frank Folk, uh, who was a player and also a friend of mine, and I started playing with him, and, and, uh, and it just really, really got into it. And then, of course, uh, I realized that uh, my legs would not let me continue to play basketball and my eyes would not let me continue to shoot and to be able to make it. So I said, well, this golf thing might be a route for me to go. So I really then said, I'm going to start playing a lot. And believe me, I do play a lot. I enjoy it. I play in mostly Brooklyn courses, too. I play in uh, uh, Marine Park. I play in Diker. Also, Forest Park, which is very close to where I live. I also play in Forest Park as well. And when I'm in D.C., I play anywhere they let me play. <laughs> so, I love golf. I really do. And now my son, you know, later on, he started playing, and now uh, I love to challenge him. You know, and, uh, and last year was the first year he was able to beat me. I don't know what's going to happen this year. <laughs> It sounds like you still are able to get a lot of golf in. About how many times a week do you think you might golf? I would say I golf at least twice a week. Twice a week? Twice a week. I wish I could do it more, but I have some other things I must do. <laughs> and I have five <laughs> grandchildren, you know, so that takes time as well. Yeah. yeah. But I must admit, you know, uh, 
the grand, the grand thing is good. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, it's so great. If I had known, I should have done that first. You had the grand first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good deal, that grand thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm just curious. You are you said that you're an avid golfer. Now, do you also watch golf? I on do. TV? I do. I watch it I, 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 uh, all the time. Every time I get a chance, I watch it. And uh, and of course, uh, I find it fun. But a lot of things that they're able to do when you go on that golf course, I can't do them. You know what I mean? I really can't. But the point is that it's just fun to just watch it and see the talent of those guys who uh, do that for a living. I'm curious on your thoughts about Tiger Woods' comeback. Do you think that we will ever see the Tiger of old. And if we do, about how long do you think it'll take for him to return to his old form? I think he's about three to four months away. I really do. I thought that he was finished, but uh, I'm convinced now that uh, he's about three to four months away from being back to winning, I would say. And he will never get back to the old Tiger, mm -hmm. but he will be able to win some tournaments. And uh, that, I think, is crucial. But the point is that... Uh, uh, he is one of the greatest ever to be out there on the golf course. I mean, no question about it. And I'm certain that uh, he's not finished. He's not finished. Three to four months, he'll probably win some other uh, tournaments. Now, you know, when we talk Tiger, we talk major titles. So can I get a prediction from you about how many major, how many more majors Tiger will win before he hangs up his golf clubs? Do you hang up golf clubs or you just retire them in the garage? Or? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> What's the right I, I way to say this, that? <laughs> at this stage, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, I would say that uh, Tiger will win at least three more. At least. Okay. He will win at least three. And um, which is, um, you know, when you're competing at that level, that is not easy to do. And uh, But uh, he has that ability to, uh, and he is able to accept the challenge and, uh, and once he's like three or four strokes down and he goes into the weekend, look out, here he comes. Oh. I mean, he gets stronger as, uh, as, 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 as the game goes along. And uh, most players, that is not the way it happens. And most players, as the game goes along, you get a little weaker, you get a little tired. But for some reason, his game picks up on its third, second, third day. I mean, that's when he gets strong. But and, uh, he's a good golfer, he really is. Now, I'm of the opinion that Mean Tiger is necessary to win more majors. Now, do you think it's going to take Mean Tiger, or can he be Nice Tiger, the one that he is now, just happy to be here to win these three titles that you say he's going to win? I think he's got to be a little both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching What's the 401 Sports, and if you're joining us via our podcast, thanks for joining us. We are finishing our conversation with Congressman Ed Towns of Brooklyn, New York, where we were discussing his upcoming golf tournament. Now, before you leave us, will you just please, one more time, share with our audience the details for your golf tournament? Right. It's on September the 27th, and it's at Marine, Marine Park in Brooklyn. That's on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. And of course, uh, the time is 10 o'clock. Come on out and join up. Those folks that play golf, I assure you that you would enjoy it. That golf course is really in tip top shape. And they have indicated to me over and over again that they plan to make that the number one public course in New York City. And I think they're well on their way to doing it because they have been investing a tremendous amount of money and time in that course. And it looks good and it plays well. And people are excited about that. And then that evening at 5 o'clock, uh, after the golfers come back in, uh, we have what we, a banquet. And the banquet is really something that I suggest that you come and just to watch it and nothing else. Uh, you, it's a fun kind of even all the activity that, that goes on is really, really, really fun, structured in a way where you, everybody has something that they can enjoy on that evening. And you can see I, I love sports. I mean, I, you know, basketball, football. Uh, and, then, and now I'm even getting into soccer. You know, I've been watching that now more and more. And, of course, baseball. You know, so I, I sort of now just sort of watch it, go to games whenever I can. 
you know. And uh, of course, uh, we have a team here in Brooklyn, you know, keep them in your prayers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, I, I'm just hoping that this year that uh, at least they'll put a few more wins on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping. So, so are we. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to talk about this week in sports. So stay tuned. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We're going to kick it off with some NFL news and one star that is now going quietly into the night, and that is former Dallas Cowboy Des Bryant. Now, Bryant was minding his own business until Stephen Jones, who is the director of player personnel, among other titles he holds, for the Dallas Cowboys, went on Sirius XM on a radio show and stated, quote, how Dak Prescott would be better off without Bryant in his ear, end quote. Now, Des Bryant isn't one to miss an opportunity to clap back, so he, respond, he responded on Twitter by saying, and I'm going to clean it up as best I can, quote, here we go with that scapegoat bleep. I charged everything to the game and went the other way. Y'all know what the real problem is. Don't put it on me with that bull bleep. Garbage A playing, play calling. Everybody lined up in the same spot for 17 weeks, end quote. Bryant went to on to call Sean Lee, his former teammate, who sat across from his locker, a snake. Now, Mike, I ask you, why are the Cowboys even mentioning Des Bryant? And Bryant says that he is in a good place. Do you actually believe that? Well, for one, I have no problem with Stephen Jones and his rebuttal here to Des Bryant. And he didn't even actually um, acknowledge the statements that Des Bryant made. He basically just came out and said, uh, what the you know moving forward, how his quarterback was going to be handling the situation without this wide receiver who's not on the team any longer. And as far as Des De Bryant, you know he's been throwing this team under the bus for a number of t uh, of months now, ever since the season finished. Uh, so this is just one of the many episodes where he's gone on social media. And fr quite frankly, I think the guy's made a jerk out of himself, and I think it's one of the reasons why he's not on a football team right now. I think it's things like this that have plagued his career. It's not necessarily what he does on the field. There is no question that Des Bryant is the hardest working wide receiver in the NFL. There's no doubt about it. The guy is a machine. He gets there at 5 a.m. He leaves at 5 p.m. He is the hardest working player on the Cowboys. He was for a number of years, but the issue with him is the way that he yells at his teammates on the sidelines, and then all the extracurricular activities that he, or the, the the problems that he has off the field, which has died down over the course of the last several years. There's no question about that. He's not necessarily one of these guys that has been involved in trouble with the law. Now, granted, he had that issue with his family, I think, early on in his career, but he's kind of, that's settled down a little bit. But it's stuff like this with him going on Twitter. This is going to be what's turning teams off from Des Bryant. Just get over it. You're not a cow by any, and a cow anymore move forward move on find your new team and to me it's just it's another example of these athletes going on social media and doing things that they shouldn't be doing well um on stephen jones's part we only uh, what was really publicized was only a part of the quote the quote in full is he's got to trust the system at which at which at times i think last year there was pressure with des in his ear to some degree Jason in his ear. Um, those great players want the ball. So Jason Witten was also part of the quote. Um, but what I think is happening is that the Cowboys are trying to figure out a reason to convince us and themselves maybe that last year was just a fluke. So two years ago, the Cowboys are riding high. They were 13 and four. Prescott won the Rookie Offensive Player of the Year. They won a playoff game. It was their first within about five years at that point. Ezekiel Elliott was tearing up the league. So everything was going great for the Cowboys. And then to follow that season up with a 9-7 and seven record and missing the playoffs, you know, they're, they're trying to find reasons why. And they have projected that Dak Prescott as the golden boy, the, the reason why that ship was moving the way it was and for what would that mean for the cowboys if their golden boy wasn't so golden that maybe it was really ezekiel elliott that moved that offense and so i think they're just trying to find reasons to to 
elevate Prescott and then also give us the impression that this year is going to be different. Um, as far as Des Bryant and whether or not he's in a good place, I don't know. I don't know how exactly he can be at at this point in stage with uncertainty in his career. We don't know where his next offer is going to come from, if he's going to get one by the start of the season. And I wouldn't um, necessarily dismiss what he said, per se, because one of Des, Des's gripes was that the play calling was not good, that it was very predictable. And that's something that I heard throughout the season last year. So then what does that mean? That also shines a light on the coaching staff. And many people think that head coach Jason Garrett is on should be on the hot seat, but he's not because of the relationship he has with Jerry Jones. And if the offensive coordinator is not really doing much with the offense to optimize it, then that's also under Jason Garrett's purview. So, you know, I think the Cowboys are really just trying to figure out how to get the ship going in the right direction. Well, in our case, hopefully it goes in the wrong direction <laughs> since we're both Giant fans. I wouldn't be sad. <laughs> Well, Keisha, we stay in the NFL for a moment, and Tom Brady, who walked out on the media just last week, when they asked him about his trainer, Alex Guerrero, and remember, Alex Guerrero is also the trainer for Julian Edelman, who, of course, was suspended for violating the NFL's drug policy. The question was whether or not Guerrero had been aware of anything that was leading up to Edelman's suspension. Was it a fair question, Keisha, and should Brady have walked out on the media the way that he did? I think it was a fair question, but I don't think I agree with the logic that prompted that question because there seems to be a straight line that people were drawing between Alex Guerrero and Julian Edelman's dirty test. And I don't think you could necessarily definitely, definitively pinpoint that. Now, it was easy to do because of circumstances. In all of Julian Edelman's training, the new variable is Alex Guerrero, so, so we, we think. Uh, so it seems. So it's easy to say, okay, you have this new person within your workout regimen, and now you have your dirty test, which, from what I recall, is his first in his career. So I could, you know, it was easy to do that. And circumstantial evidence, you know, can be um, weighed upon heavily. We've seen some people get convicted in the court of law due to circumstantial evidence, but it also allows for. Uh, theories to be poked in when you don't really have the smoking gun. And one thing that stood out to me was when Guerrero made his statement in defense of himself, um, he reminded me that athletes usually, not usually, it's not uncommon for athletes to use different people to do different things for them. So Alex Guerrero may, be a train, may train him in one area, but he, Julia may have another trainer in another area to help him with and so on and so forth. So maybe any one of them could have given it to him, or Julian maybe just acted on himself and took whatever he did to get the uh, positive test. Uh, as far as Brady walking out, I mean, come on, Brady, you're better than that. You are an OG in this league. You should know how to handle the media. And I, I'm a, probably guessing that he was aware of these kind of rumblings with Alex Guerrero being connected to Julian Edelman. So I think that he has enough he should have enough media savvy to be able to answer this question without walking off. A simple no comment would do. And take a page from Bill Belichick. I know they have there's a reports of strife between the two, but Bill Belichick is one of the most tight-lipped coaches, and he's been asked tons of questions regarding scandals and this and that and the other, and he has his stock answer, and he stays with it, and he'll sit there and he'll repeat it 20, 20 million times. If you ask him 20 million times, he'll get the same answer. So Tom Brady, I, I was hoping that he could have handled that a little better. Yeah, follow the, the code of your leader, right? Bill Belichick, who goes up in these press conferences and, you know, not only questions that he's willing to answer, but the ones uh, that he's not willing to answer, he always will respond to them, usually with one-word responses, and he sort of brushes the media off. And I think Tom Brady could have taken a lesson from that. Look, I thought that this was certainly fair game for the media to go ahead and ask Tom Brady these questions about Julian Edelman and the, and the connection that he had with Alex Guerrero. And I think also that some of this frustration that Brady has, the way that 
that he walked out. It's not just necessarily with the media. I think it's also, as you pointed out, there is certainly a rift within the franchise, not just between Brady and Belichick, but also Brady's connection with Alex Guerrero and how that's affected Brady in the re- within the rest of the organization. So I think that there was certainly some built-up frustration on Brady's part. But you know what? Look, you're the face of the NFL, right? You're a future Hall of Famer. You're the, the, you're the Sports Illustrated cover boy. You're the guy that the NFL sells constantly year after year he's in all these Super Bowls you got to go up there and you got to just take the shots you know you got to be willing to stand up there and you don't even have to answer the questions but walking out on the media the way that he did I thought it was petty and I thought it was just too sensitive from his part welcome back to what's the 401 sports we're in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report The Brooklyn Nets acquired Jared Dudley for a veteran presence in the locker room. During a press conference last week, Dudley recounted a story from his time with the Milwaukee Bucks. He said then head coach Jason Kidd walked into the locker room full of young players and told them, quote, if you don't think we're making the playoffs in this conference, let me know, end quote. The Bucks went from a 15-win team to a 500 club that season. Mike, Do you think that the Nets can surprise the NBA like the Milwaukee Bucks did that one year? Well, uh, irony here, right, is that Jason Kidd, former coach of the Nets, who ditches them, leaves them at the altar kind of, and then goes on to Milwaukee and then winds up getting fired by the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, So I thought that was kind of interesting here. But Jared Dudley, um, I thought, really stole the show here. I I know he brought a lot of positivity to the table with this press conference that he had. There's no question about that. I don't think that he's going to be a guy that's going to come in here and grab 12 rebounds a game and get lots of minutes. But I think this is someone that, since he came from Boston College, he's been around in the league for a number of years now. This is the type of leadership that they need. And you need that type of veteran type of player that's going to help boost the confidence of some of these younger players. You know, um, the Nets... They've made some very good off-season moves. There's no question about that. I think that without a doubt, they're most they're going to wind up being a below 500 team this season. But I think that they're still on the come up. I think that that there are blue skies ahead as opposed to what we've seen in the past. But as Dudley points out, you know, you can make a quick turnaround like that. You just need to make a couple of moves. But the thing is, when you look at what the Milwaukee Bucks had with the Greek Freak and some of these other role players that they surrounded him with. I think that that certainly had a huge influence on why they were able to become a playoff contender in the Eastern Conference. So I think I loved Dudley's press conference. I got to see some of it. Um, And I thought that as opposed to a lot of the negative stuff that we've seen with the Nets, here's a guy that's brought some positivity on the table for this team moving forward. But as far as them being a big surprise, I think that that's a lot to ask for. Right. Um, Jared Dudley, I think he has about 18 basketball lies. Every time I think he's out of the league, I get an alert that he's signed with the team. But great for him. I mean, I've seen him over the course of his career. And then also he has done some appearances on television. And he's really a positive, well-spoken person. He seems very knowledgeable about the game. So hopefully the the younger players in the team will will listen to him because I always wondered you know when you hear about teams adding veteran presence you know do the young people really listen or like what's their interaction with the uh, person who has been there for in the league for a lot of years um in terms of surprising the NBA it's it depends on the magnitude of a surprise are they going to make the playoffs probably not are they going to um, be number one in the conference? Probably not. But if they can, you know, if this, the benchmark is maybe winning 10 more games, 15 more games than the season before, then maybe so. I mean, I think that's definitely doable. But um, so I think it's going to be smaller steps. It's not going to be a turnaround like the Milwaukee Bucks had. Yeah. Well, you know, Keisha, we, uh, one of the guys we love to talk about, Odell Beckham. Someone was recently speaking about him, and it was Rashad Jennings who said that Odell Beckham Jr. is absolutely capable of leading the Giants. Do you think that Odell is capable of leading the New York Giants? Capable, yes. Um, Will he be a leader? I don't know yet. Um, I think Odell Beckham, he has the capability to be and do whatever he wants to. And he, he definitely puts in the work to be the superstar on the field that he is now now and but we've seen uh questionable judgment calls made by him 
off the field. And the most recent being that video with the woman and some questionable substance while they were eating pizza in a hotel room. <laughs> so, and that wasn't that long ago. So I think there's still definitely room to to grow maturity wise and through that evolution he may evolve to be a leader in the way that we we traditionally think of leaders because part of being a good leader is exercising good judgment so um but i think he could also be a leader just by his example by his work ethic his fire in his passion for the game, his fire and his passion to win. That stuff can be contagious. So I can see him being a leader in that regard. But I think it, it might be a, a couple more years until he becomes a more well-rounded leader. Yeah, I think with Odell Beckham, you know, look, when you when you take his numbers in the first four years that he's played in the NFL, and of course uh, he had the injury plague season last year where he went out, I think after, what, the fourth game, it was in, during the fourth game of the season. Um, now the thing is with Odell Beckham, his numbers, they stack up. Like with again, you know, Jerry Rice's numbers are a little bit better, but Larry Fitzgerald and you know Julio Jones, Antonio Brown, some of these other great wide receivers in the NFL over the course of the last five, ten, even fifteen years, Michael Irvin, um, his numbers are really, really good. I think what Odell Beckham needs to focus on, obviously, is. Um, just doing what he does best, and that's being a game-changing player for the Giants, without a doubt. The off-the-field stuff, I mean, there's a part of me that feels like that's always going to be there. That I just think that this guy has this impulsive behavior that if he hasn't been able to fix it by now, I know that he's been in the league for a number of years, that this stuff is going to continue and continue. But at the same time, he's so good that it just seems like the Giants are willing to just let a lot of this stuff slide. As far as him being a leader, I think that there have been times where he's shown that he can be a leader, you know, without a doubt. And it's not just by scoring touchdowns, but it's by, you know, picking up some of his teammates. He is a rah-rah guy on the sidelines. You see him when the defense is there pumping his arms up like that to get the crowd motivated and get into the game. But only time will tell, and I think that right now there's certainly some optimism for this Giants team. Last season was tough. Uh, Odell Beckham was one of the lone bright spots early on in the season, and then here the guy goes out with this crazy freaking injury. So I wish him the best. I hope that he can turn this thing around and, and hopefully, you know, be a great Giant for years to come. I think one one way that he's shown to be a leader is not holding out because he know he's in the middle of um, trying to renegotiate get, get a big payday and there was talk about him possibly holding out until he got that deal signed but what he did was he showed up he did what he could do um, physically and also medically because he was on medical restriction during the the off season um, OTAs and mini camps so I mean I think that's one positive way because we see Julio Jones has a holdout right. because he wants more money so I think you know that might be uh, one example of the evolution of Odell Beckham yeah. being a more mature person and a leader on and off the field. So we're rooting for you, OBJ. Um, go Giants. So, Mike, we are at the time where we have to say goodbye to everybody. But don't worry. You can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. Also, be sure to download our podcast on Apple Podcast, Google Play Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports, and we look forward to checking you out again next week.